So, which jobs are going away and which ones are going to stay? Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired software engineer from Microsoft going back to the MS-DOS and Windows 95 days, and I've been a professional software engineer for some 40 years. I started in BASIC and assembly language and then learned C and C++ and later C-sharp and JavaScript and Python and the whole catastrophe, as they would say. And would I do it again? Of course I would, because as I'm fond of saying, I've been very fortunate, yet I'd trade it all for a little more. Plus, I just love to code that I've been paid to do it this long as spectacularly fortunate. But what about today? Does it make any sense to go into software engineering right now? Or won't ChatGPT effectively do all the programming for us? Well, I'm here to argue that both things may be true. Some programming jobs definitely are going away, but others are going to become even more valuable than they are today. And I'm going to help you sort out which is which, so you can hopefully avoid heading down a useless alley. In fact, one of my sons just started a software engineering degree in university, and so this is as much advice to my own family as it is to you. It's just my opinion, but I hope you do like it. And if you do, please consider subscribing to my channel. I don't have any Patreons, and I'm mostly in this just for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. And do make sure you've turned on the all notifications icon for the channel so that you actually see future episodes. So, which jobs are going away and which ones are going to stay? Well, big picture, I'm worried less about any specific language or area of expertise, and I'm more worried about overall competence. If you graph programming ability across a population of coders, I imagine it's something like a normal distribution. And I'll tell you right now that the people on the far right side of that graph are doing very well today and will be fine for a long, long time. Because the reality is, even if ChatGPT were three times better at blasting out some tasty Python boilerplate, that's not what those folks are doing all day anyway. If you're debugging the call stack for an SRAM cache miss in an interrupt handler of a microcontroller because of a reference counting bug and a shared pointer off in some library, you're going to be okay. There aren't many human programmers who are truly excellent at debugging complex synchronization issues to begin with, and it will be quite some time before ChatGPT can do it for you. If, on the other hand, you're the kind of programmer they task with changing the year in the mail merge header just about halfway through every January, then it might be time to think about truck driving school. Okay, maybe that's a little harsh. And most trucks will drive themselves soon enough anyway. Actually, I figured a little running convoys in the front truck will have a pro driver akin to a train engineer. Fewer truckers, but with higher end skills. And I argue programming will be similar. The difference between AI programming and trucking, however, is that we're about to face an explosion in AI and AI development. Even if half of today's programming positions were somehow eliminated, within a few years, that many more will be created in service of taking advantage of the power of AI. So the jobs will change for sure, and in ways that we'll talk about shortly. But there might wind up being far more software jobs than there are today. The key point, however, is that being a valuable software engineer isn't about writing the code. Most of my code has been operating systems code, so it's a bit different, but I'd say I spent 20% of my time at best coding and another 80% debugging and validating that code. That doesn't mean I wrote a lot of buggy code that I then had to spend four times as long fixing. It means that with the rare exceptions of personal projects like Task Manager and Zip Folders, I didn't write a lot of fresh new code anyway. The cases where you can get paid good money to write main.cpp over and over are actually pretty few and far between. Instead, let's consider a task like porting the Win95 shell over to Windows NT, something I spent a long year on in 1994. The bulk of that work fell into two broad categories, updating the code base to be Unicode or 16-bit characters, and then making it all work atop the NT kernel. As just one example that I think ChatGPT is a long way from solving on its own, we had to address the problem of file shortcuts. So imagine you create a shortcut to a text file on your Windows 95 desktop, and you wind up copying that shortcut to a floppy disk and taking it to your Windows NT machine. That machine operates in Unicode, not ASCII, but it still has to be able to read the original shortcut. But it also has to allow you, under NT, to rename the shortcut to a complex kanji string. Or kanji. I don't know. I've only read it in box. And better yet, you should still be able to take that floppy back to the Windows 95 machine, and the shortcut still has to work and not crash Windows 95, and since Windows 95 is already pretty much carved in stone, no changes can be made there. So every aspect of the interrupt had to be handled on the NT side in a backward compatible but forward looking way. It wasn't a process of writing code so much as figuring out what code even had to be written. I fully expect that within a couple of years, AI will be able to do the grunt work of that porting process, or perhaps the easy 90% of it. 
But the harder aspects of compatibility between systems, not to mention the very human problem of where compromises are going to be made, will be more elusive. And that's where you, as a software engineer, should be aiming to add value. Let's say that AI's coding abilities continue to improve on their current trajectory for another decade. It's probably a given that within that time frame, we'll have gone from the ability to write a crisp subroutine up to complete solutions and applications that come out of the AI fully turnkey. The question at that point is whether we then treat those solutions as black boxes or as source code creations. And when they don't work perfectly, as they inevitably won't, where will a future software engineer invest their time? In debugging the source code or simply revising the specification that was given to the AI so that it can learn and try again? Either way, it's still going to require a software engineer of some kind to participate with the AI in that feedback loop of tweaking the result until it perfectly matches the requirements. In the shorter term, we're still going to have large source code trees that produce our solutions and applications, and I think we'll spend a lot of time with AI-generated and AI-assisted code before we reach that stage where fully formed solutions emerge, pass all the unit tests, and can be handed off to the customer with a UI. Some of the more mundane programming jobs that don't require a lot of skill will go away. But it's also equally possible that even more technical jobs will open up in being a liaison between the customer and the AI and that the people who used to write entry-level code instead will write the prompts and issue the feedback that tunes the AI in the production of that same software. Which is all to say that some, in fact a lot of, programming jobs will indeed go away replaced by AI-generated code. But the future is bright for software engineers. Let's take a look at some of the reasons that your future as a software engineer can be a secure one and how you can help make your own luck in that regard. First of all, there's the issue of complex problem solving. While AI can automate certain tasks, it still struggles with complex unstructured problem solving that requires deep understanding, creativity, and innovation. Software engineering often does, or it should at least, involve tackling unique challenges that AI cannot autonomously resolve, at least not yet. Next, we have the gifts of insight and intuition. A significant part of engineering involves understanding human needs, behaviors, and preferences. AI lacks the innate human ability to intuitively grasp these aspects, which are crucial for designing user-centric applications. There are also sometimes ethical and decision-making considerations. These decisions often require human judgment and a nuanced understanding of societal norms and ethics. Good software engineering often requires customization and personalization for a particular customer. Custom software development often requires a deep understanding of specific client needs and contexts. AI in its current state is not adept at fully grasping and adapting to such varied and nuanced requirements. And finally, and perhaps rather ironically, highly skilled software engineers will be in great demand to actually design, build, and deploy the AI systems themselves. As AI evolves, the demand for professionals to build, update, and manage those systems will likely increase. Thus, while AI can automate and assist with certain aspects of programming, it is unlikely to replace programmers entirely. The role of human programmers will likely evolve, focusing on the more complex, creative, and interpersonal aspects of software development that AI cannot replicate. To maximize your own chances of success, then, the best thing you can do is to make sure you're as far right on the competency curve as possible for you. The jobs that will be most disrupted and impacted will be those available to folks on the lower end of that curve, and the most security can be found, as always, by trying to be indispensable. As an example of something that might seem banal to some, imagine you have a team of 10 engineers getting paid to port old cool ball business code to some modern language. In two years, you're likely going to have an AI and three engineers to run it. My conjecture, then, is you're better off being in the top third than the bottom third. In other words, there's still plenty of gold in our hills, but the days of easy picking nuggets out of the creek are long past. For the dedicated and the innovative, though, it's the beginning of a whole new gold rush. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on the matter, and I do read all the comments, so sound off and let me know. If you're on the autism spectrum, or if someone you know, love, live with, or work with is, you owe it to yourself to get my book on Asperger's and ASD. In addition to containing everything I now know about autism that I wish I'd known long ago, it contains specific chapters on working for someone with ASD, managing someone with ASD, and various other employment topics. Check out the link to the free sample in the video description. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. And yes, I'm just getting over influenza, so if I sound a little funny and look a little funny, that'd be why. See you later.